A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 9 Elsie Makes Out Elsie started school at the age of four in 1912. Academic standards in the board schools still didn't rise sufficiently even after the 1902 Act set out target levels for Standards 1 and 2. Standard 1 required an ability to read from a textbook, including words of more than one syllable. Dictation, writing down a few common words in a neat hand, and the ability to add up and subtract not more than four figures, and the recitation of the multiplication table up to six, were all in the same standard, Standard 1. Many children didn't reach even this low standard, and it is unfortunate that teachers resorted to harsh methods to improve their standards. Tetworth Church of England School, at the turn of the 20th century, laid great emphasis on the principles of Christian religion, morals, reading, writing, and the casting of accounts with beads. Some pupils went on to grammar schools. Girls were accepted into the village school, but not into the grammar, where the school curriculum consisted of Latin grammar and literature, history and geography to some degree, and a little Greek. The scriptures were essential, so too arithmetic, mental arithmetic and addition. Diction and manners given special regard, along with national heroes, marching some games and physical exercise, they were all considered fitting, if not overdone. Boys attended six days of the week and church on Sundays. Those parishioners who valued education, the ability to read and write and reckon, were usually those who could afford to do without their child's labour for as long as was necessary. Those folk were tradesmen, yeoman farmers and lesser gentry. When the school boards were put in place, it was to those citizens, unable to afford individual lessons by tutors and public schools, they were planning for. The school's inspectors noticed in both town and country the bad treatment of school children. The nation's children were, from this time forward, going to be educated. The payment of teachers, by results, had disappeared by the time Elsie went to school. Although the children in Tatworth had the benefit of an education in a new school, operating a regulated curriculum, they still lacked the cultural benefits available to town children. The Board of Education defied elementary education as forming and strengthening the character of children and developing their intelligence assisting boys and girls to fit themselves for the work of life. Girls were expected to be self-sacrificing, domesticated and moral. Boys were to be hard-working, loyal and brave, and both extolled as children of the, of the Empire. The nation was proud of itself, believing that there was further noble deeds to be done. The Empire was supported throughout the country. Heads of rural schools not only maintained discipline within the school, but were sometimes expected to control the behaviour of their charges outside as well. In many outlying hamlets, setting older children to school was lo looked on as wasteful labour. When Elsie went to school in 1912, children were being given cocoa or some other warm drink for a penny during the midday break. The local nurse still discovered dirty heads during a school inspection and teachers were always taking care that when children scratched they were inspected for lice or flea bites. Inferior meals at home caused some of the children to be undernourished. Giving free school meals afforded the school the opportunity to instill good manners and proper eating habits to eat properly with a knife and fork. A full-time dentist travelled from school to school checking the children's teeth. He carried out inspections whilst the children were sent out to play. Cheap spectacles were obtained free of charge and instruction given about the correct way to clean one's teeth.
the health of the nation's children had become a national issue and initiatives started to improve the general state of health and other child welfare matters. The Round Tree Foundation highlighted the serious physical deterioration amongst the poorer sections of the community in their 1901 publication. The First World War evened out the vast differences between the children's health in good and bad areas by government inspection. At the turn of the 20th century, most working-class families expected their children to contribute to the running of the household. Tasks were learned that followed their parents round the home, helping as they went. The boys took on the heavier work whilst the girls helped with the sewing and food preparation. Water had to be brought from the stream and wood from the stack, and every day had its routine of household chores before going to school. It was expected that Elsie and her sisters help their mother look after the chickens, fetch the eggs and clean them out. The washing had to be mangled, hung out, turned and then ironed when dry. The vegetables gathered from the garden were washed and put away for the next meal. There was a half-time system at the mill. Children over the age of ten could do limited work hours whilst receiving their education, and this continued until well into the 1920s. The First World War had carried the momentum of social change shattering the old ways. Things were never to be the same again. It wasn't long before the working class had had to adapt the upper classes, particularly the large landowners, lost their sons who were going to take over work in the estate. Children still worked at the mill, crawling under the looms with bare feet to stop slipping, to retrieve the ends of broken threads. These ends had to be instantly repaired in very hot and damp conditions, very to quickly get the gliding jennies back into action again. They felt proud they were contributing to the family's income as they felt the sixpence in their pockets. The children of farm workers also turned their hand to the work in the fields, picking up stones, weeding the crops and collecting potatoes. No child of the poor was allowed to get away from working for their keep. The bell on the schoolhouse roof tolled at nine o'clock. It seemed very loud, and the pigeons scattered at its sound. The noisiness of the children greeting friends subsided, and the running around stilled. Lines were formed outside the door, and all waited for the teacher to admit them. No talking was allowed, and each child allotted a seat, after the girls put on their pinnies. Any late comer received a black mark, and this was entered into the term report. The roll was called when attendants were ticked off in red. All the Collins children went to this school. There was no escaping either the building of its influence or its influence. It was built opposite Rosalie Cottage. Prayers and hymns started the day at the school assembly. Always the well-known favourites, learnt by heart, as the scholastic subjects were reinforced by repeating them in rhyme, intoned in a sing-song fashion. It was an unchanging ritual, going back generations. Classes started at nine o'clock and lasted until 3.30 every day. These went on until she was fourteen. The school hall was divided by a large curtain, which didn't reach the top of the pitched roof, one side for the younger children and the other side for the older ones. The sun's rays, finding a gap in the curtain, penetrating the dusty haze, created a spectrum on the opposite wall as they passed through the glass, normally drawn back for morning assembly and special occasions. A train certificated male assistant teacher received £100 per year. His female colleague received £10 less. Teacher training colleges insisted upon a strict religious calling for their student intake. They must be free from all faults. It was about moral ascendancy over literary knowledge. It was not always the case that properly trained teachers filled the vacancies. 
acting teachers, who were usually the brightest girl in their final year, were pre pre preferred. Heads considered that they understood their jobs better and had an empathy with their charges. Elementary teachers were uncultivated and imperfectly educated, commented one school inspector. It was not unusual for the local squire or magist magistrate to require school teachers to attend Sunday school, play the piano and organise out-of-school educational trips without payment. The first and second year children followed the seasons with calendar records, noting when the first snowdrop showed itself, when the first cuckoo called and when the first swallows flew. The class would be given the task of drawing these and the best ones displayed on the wall. The infants and newcomers used slates and squeaky slate pencils. They followed approved lessons like English and arithmetic examined by the local authority. Scripture was compulsory for all and once a week the vicar would come to talk about moral behaviour told in the form of a story. Country children were taught to observe and appreciate the countryside and local history sometimes by a village elder. When the class was considered capable, they were given lead pencils and told to copy letters of the alphabet and words from cardboard specimens. The next stage, after obtaining the correct standard, exercise books with faint green lines were passed out, was to copy off the blackboard simple sentences, and this carried them to the next stage, linking sentences together to make a paragraph. After the two years, the class graduated to the use of pen and ink. Every day, the ink monitor would pass out the filled china ink wells, placing them in the drilled holes at the top of each desk. It was found difficult to control the ink at first, or even to make the pen work at all. The nibs had to be cleaned, and the points not splayed out or crossed by too much pressure, when a new one was issued. Blots and smudges appeared as if by magic. Sleeves and hair sometimes got in the way. But these hurdles were soon overcome and the class settled down to perfect their copper plate writing. Less pressure on the pen for upstrokes and a firmer pressure on the way down. There was always a controversy whether strokes should follow each other directly on top or those going up instead of making a loop. It was considered important by school authorities that drill superseded random gy gy gymnastics. The class was told to swing their arms forward with the opposite leg in military fashion. All the arm and leg movements were to be done in correct order, following an accepted pattern, so that each exercise was known in advance. Every muscle had an approved exercise and running strictly regulated. If the day were particularly cold, then marching, swinging the arms, hopping and coordinated exercise, the class all followed round and round, folding and unfolding like a snake. There was never enough space for games and no equipment if there were. Once a year, there was sports day, when all the classes did their exercises before the parents. There were three-legged races, egg and spoon and sack races, throwing the bean bag and catching the ball. All the children had to bring an enamel mag to school so that lemonade could be served out. There were iced and currant buns provided by the school authorities, prizes won and achievements recognised, usually in the form of a book. Music lessons consisted of practicing singing the national anthem, the national songs of each country making up Britain, popular patriotic songs and folk songs, and this involved much practice, which was taught using the tonic so far system, using a tuning fork to start on the right note. Days of national significance were cele celebrated by the whole school, marching onto the playground to salute the flag and sing along the songs practiced so carefully. After the First World War, Armistice Day was observed when once again the whole school assembled to salute the flag and observe the two-minute silence with a flag at half-mast. Saints' Day's 
celebrated by flying the Union Jack and the flag of St George, a prerequisite for all organisations and groups. Empire Day considered the most important national event next to the King's birthday. Patriotic songs sang and tales of daring do, exploration, discovery and invention read aloud and cheered. All these national events were celebrated during the Sunday school service following on from the school. Elsie and her class were taken for country walks where the names of plants and trees were written down and the local wildlife pointed out. Collections of grasses, leaves, butterflies and other insects mounted and named. Records of when certain things happened throughout the year were copied down and the older children made their own, up their own sketchbooks which were initialed and coloured up. Prizes were presented in the hall at the end of each year and these were mostly books, religious um, books, Bibles and hymn books. There were three teachers and headmasters taking different groups called standards. Infants were taught to knit dishcloths and to patch holes and darn. Elementary dressmaking, buttonhole stitching and pleating were also taught. Reading was considered especially important and frequently checked by the school inspector. The quality of writing using correct English neatly formed geography, history and nature study, needlework, cooking and gardening. Most girls had long hair, plaits or ponytails. When leaving school for work, hair was put up either in a bun or braids round the head or draped either side below the ears. Where possible, in large families, most of the clothes would be hand-me-downs. If these were not available, they were purchased at bring and buy sales or made by mother. Father repaired the shoes in the outhouse, hammering in the long blakies and studs. Generally, the dresses were of checked gingham, knitted socks and cotton knickers. Winter wear, usually navy skirts attached to a bodice with hand-knitted jumper, knee-high socks, brown lace-up shoes, knitted woolen vest, a liberty bodice, button down the front, an assortment of other buttons to hold up suspenders and knickers. In extremely cold weather, fleecy knickers were worn with a pocket for a handkerchief. Nothing was ever wasted in the clothing line. Discarded clothes were cut down, shortened, tightened up, patched, darned or cut into squares for rag, rag rugs. Worn sheets turned side to middle or made into pillowcases. Worn pillowcases became handkerchiefs, liners or tea towels. There was no end to the amount of make-do and men necessary to look after a large family. All families had a rag bag, the contents useful for repairs or making up patchwork quilts and mats. The only outside school building was the coal shed and a row of lavatories in the playground. They contained a wooden seat over a bucket that was emptied each week by the school caretaker who also provided the torn up newspaper on a string. There were lessons on health and hygiene, the importance of washing hair and emphasised as was brushing teeth, cutting nails and what was good to eat. The importance of bathing, the girls were taught how to look after babies, however there were no lessons on sex. Girls were instructed on how to look after and run a home and this was linked to sewing and make-up of curtains and covers. Boys were instructed how to dig, why to dig and how to plant out vegetables and run a greenhouse. Simple woodwork lessons explained how tools were used and for what reason. There were talks on how to avoid common ailments by a local nurse who cautioned about practising old country remedies, dispelling superstitions and tales of false beliefs, especially about the menstruation period. Some children smelled strongly and no one wanted to share a desk with them. Much of the nurse's talk was trying to make children aware without spelling out the truth. Children sometimes wore underneath 
underwear all the year through. There was neither school milk nor lunches. Sandwiches were eaten at the lunch break. There was always water from the tap in the playground. The eldest children did not finish until 3.45 to give the infants and their mothers time to clear the front entrance. And those children who had an elder brother or sister to take them home had to wait outside. The rooms were well lit because there were such large windows set into the gable ends. In winter it was always cold due to the high ceilings. Two large round stoves heated both ends of the room. However much the stoves were stoked up, it was never sufficient to heat the corners. The floor was bare boards which gave off clouds of dust whenever there was any movement, particularly when there was the morning assembly and for the dancing class. Infants were taught to knit with two needles and then four, darning using wooden mushrooms, how to turn, hem and take up and gather in, how to sew on buttons, make floor cloths and cover buttons were taught, fraying out, removing each separate thread from a patch of material and unpicking. Unravelling an old wooden woolen garment were methods used to provide material to make up for new. Sewing bags made and each girl's initials graced the sides. These were end of term tests and used by the teachers to keep one class quiet whilst the other in the room carried on with their reading and writing. Material was supplied by the council, always white cotton. From this article of clothing cl were made pillowcases and nighties. Patterns had to be traced suitable for the child's size. There was a communal box of thimbles, ne needles and thread. Embroidery with coloured wool made simple samplers. A school inspector of the day noted that a number of children had died through diphtheria. The winter always brought the usual bout of illnesses. Whooping cough, mumps, chicken pox, scarlatina, diphtheria, scarlet fever, colds and influenza. The school's medical officer had to be notified especially of an outbreak. These problems affected the standard of education. Special lessons were arranged for children to catch up with lost lessons. Regular attendance by the doctor and nurse to inspect for medical examination and general cleanliness. Dr. Forces and Kosh and Daniel came from charge surgeries, as did Shepherd Weaver and Geely, the dentists. If there were any problems, the patients were visited to check that action had been taken. Heads were examined by the nurse for nits and general health. Proper clothing and shoes for winter wear identified, reported and logged. There were no aspirins or cold remedies. Antibiotics not long discovered. Infections spread by contact. In the early twenties there was a national epidemic of mumps and illnesses. <laughs>